You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We're joined today by award-winning author and filmmaker, Mark Olshaker. Mark, thank you so much for joining us on Mind Over Murder. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We're pretty excited about this. We've been trying to get you for the longest time, and now you finally said yes. I no, didn't know it had been that long. No, we're completely teasing. Kristen asked, and you said yes, and we very much appreciate it. And you didn't keep us waiting at all. I do have a new book out now, so that's another reason. Yes, we are so jazzed to talk about it. Before we get into the book, start by telling our listeners a little bit about your educational and professional background. Oh, okay. I have a college degree, and that's about all. I was an English major, actually American literature, because that was one of the few fields that didn't have a comprehensive exam at the end, and I was lazy then. But I've been a writer and a filmmaker longer than I, I care to admit at this point, mainly doing <laughs> documentary films for PBS on a whole range of subjects. I've written a number of and published a number of novels, beginning with the one called Einstein's Brain when I was a very young man. And uh, for about the last 20 years or so, I've been writing books about true crime with John Douglas, the FBI's behavioral science pioneer, among other things. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. How did you partner up with John Douglas? Was it Were you guys working together on a special for PBS? I know you did well. Well, it's, it's an interesting story. I had been writing and producing some documentary films for NOVA, the PBS science series, mm -hmm. on various subjects, public health, things like that. I had uh, read like everybody else in my field, Silence of the Lambs. And I went mm -hmm. to the producer, the executive producer of NOVA at WGBH in Boston, Paula Apsell. And I said, Paula, I've read this novel, Silence of the Lambs, which was a bestseller. I understand they're making a movie out of it. If the movie's anywhere near as good as the book, I think it's going to be a big hit. I had no idea, of course, at the time, how big a hit it would be. <laughs> but I said, why don't we go behind the scenes and tell the real story behind these profilers and behavioral scientists at the FBI Academy in Quantico. And at first, she was a little skeptical. She said, it's psychology, it's soft science, we do more hard science. I said, yeah, but I think it would be really good and it'll get big ratings. So she finally gave me the go-ahead to go do it with my production partner, Larry Klein. This was before serial killers were a big thing. So I called the FBI public relations office at Quantico and I said, I'm from NOVA, the PBS science series. We're thinking of doing a film about you guys. Talk about it. And they said, sure. So they, we did. We went down there. We decided to do the film. We started hanging around what was then called the investigative support unit. I got to know John Douglas and the other 11 or 12 profilers. We did a film called Mind of a Serial Killer, which was nominated for a News and Documentary National Emmy Award. It rated very well on PBS. Then, I don't know how many months later, or maybe even longer than that, John Douglas called me and said, I'm getting ready to retire from the FBI. Do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And I said, I certainly am. Let's check it out. So I called my agent. We did up a proposal. We went to New York, presented it to a number of publishers. Several were very interested. And out of that came Mindhunter, which became my first big bestseller. We took it from there. We thought it would be a one-off. It did so well. And we had so many interesting stories yet to tell that we just kept going. So that's where we are now. These last couple of books we've done, starting with this, The Killer's Shadow, about the racist and anti-Semitic serial killer, Joseph Paul Franklin. 
Now, when a killer calls, our latest one, we started focusing on individual cases and really going in depth and trying to show the drama, the tragedy, the triumph, what's really going on when you go into a case in depth. So that's where we are right now. The case we're talking about, the case of the abduction and murder of two young women, one actually one young woman and one girl in Mm -hmm. Columbia, South Carolina in the 1980s, is probably one of the most emotional and interesting and yet heartbreaking cases that John has ever been involved with. Take us a little bit more inside your process, if you will, Mark. You have written a number of successful books together. In terms of where you started when you first sat down with John and said, okay, we're going to co-write a book, which ultimately became Mindhunter. Yeah. How do you go about doing what you do? First of all, how do you pick the case? Take us through it a little bit just in terms of the logistics of two writers coming together to write this thing. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, Bill. We sometimes joke that John is a detective pretending to be a writer and be a detective, <laughs> but it's become pretty collaborative. When we first started, I just debriefed him for weeks and weeks. We recorded everything. Our research assistant, Ann Hennigan, took notes and wrote up everything for us so we would know what we were talking about. And Anne is still with us after all these years. I just wanted to get into the depth of it, how he thinks. One of the things you you all probably know from the reading Mind Hunter and watching the Mind Hunter series on Netflix is when you interview successful, which means serial killers, predators, and rapists in prison, you're looking to correlate what was going on in the offender's mind before, mm-hmm. during, and after the crime. By the same token, I wanted to know what was going on in John's mind as he approached each of these crimes and how it worked and how he came to the conclusions he did, how he interacted with local police and detectives and other FBI personnel. In so doing that, I also picked up a sense of the rhythm of how he talks. So once we finished all of that, then we went over all the cases and said, all right, we'll start out talking about how you got into this. Then let's pick cases which we think really show something about how the process worked and also show something about how the criminal's mind works. One thing I should say right now that we've tried never to do, and I don't think we ever have, is to try to in any way glamorize the killer or the predator or the criminal in any way. These people are not glamorous. They're not Hannibal Lecter. Thank God there aren't any real Hannibal Lecters. We also wanted to, at the same time, really personalize the victim's and the detectives and the police officers, the sheriffs, the people who really dedicated their lives to bringing these people to justice. Those were our ground rules going forward. It was a question of telling stories. And I appeared once for Kristen's English classes, I think, and we talked about how you put together a story. And I think, to me, the key is, I always want my readers to be asking, what happens next? So, We certainly want to tell the real story, but we want to tell it in a way that's revelatory and that you learn things as a reader at the same time that the detective, the profiler, or the investigator learns them. So that's where we started from, and I think it served us well. And I hope that my novel writing skills, I've published five novels, I think, I hope that my novel writing skills have helped to make that process work. I binged your most recent book about in about five hours on our most recent snow day down oh, here in wow. Virginia. You put it down, first of all. You are right. It is probably the most gut-wrenching and emotional of all of the cases of yours that I've read. I should mention to our listeners that I have read every single book that you guys have put out. God bless you, Kristen. <laughs> She's going to keep that business going. I am, 100%. What is the deciding factor on the case we're going to cover for this book? This most recent book with the Sherry Smith case, it is gut-wrenching. How did you guys decide that you were going to tackle that? That had to have been very emotionally difficult. Again, a very interesting question. Several books ago, we sat down with our edit, Matt Harper, in New York. He proposed that we start doing this series of individual cases Mm. to go along with the books we've written about larger themes. 
we said, okay, what do you have in mind? What cases do you think we ought to do? Whatever you want, and just decide a criterion for choosing them. I said, I think the criterion should be what's most interesting. And I said, I'm not sure how to define that. He said, here's a thought. What about cases that affected John most profoundly? And it could be affected him in an emotional way. It could be affected him from a procedural way in terms of how you go about investigating a crime or what you learned from it that, uh, that really advanced the technique of criminal investigative analysis and the behavioral profiling. So we thought that was a pretty good way to start. He said, give me offhand the first couple that you'd like to do. And we thought about it. And we said, the Joseph Paul Franklin case, very useful in this way. I say useful in a very professional sense because it's a very gut-wrenching case. Yeah. But it was the first time that a serial killer had been motivated essentially by racial and religious hatred. Mm. He was a very interesting case in that he wasn't confined to one place, one method of killing, or one geographical area. He was all over the place and even at one point, we think contemplated killing a president. So this was somebody who was very difficult to catch, very difficult to understand. We thought this would be a very interesting case. The other reason that it was so important is a serial killer who kills because of some kind of sexual perversion or sadistic nature, maybe other serial killers, a few of them might imitate him, but nobody's going to look up to him. The thing mm -hmm. about Joseph Paul Franklin, he had been in the Ku Klux Klan, he'd been in the National States Rights Party, he'd been in the American Nazi Party. He quit all of these because he thought they were all just talk. He actually wanted action. He wanted to foment a race war. The thing that was so scary about him is he is the kind of person who, if you get the wrong kind of person, and there's plenty of them in this, in this country now, mm -hmm. will actually look up to somebody like this. If you look at Dylan Roof, who killed all of those um, black parishioners in South Carolina, he was, in a sense, Joseph Paul Franklin's spiritual child. Right. Like Franklin, he wanted to commit himself to fomenting a race war. And he thought that whatever happened to him, it wouldn't matter because uh, once the race war happened, his com comrades would break him out of prison and that would be that. The Sherry Faye Smith case and the Deborah May Helmick case that we talk about in the new book, When a Killer Calls, it's a completely different kind of offender and a completely different kind of case. We start out with uh, Sherry Smith, a beautiful 17-year-old blonde. She's a singer. She's very talented. She's going to graduate from high school in two days. And then she stops at the top of her driveway, a long driveway down to her parents' house to pick up the mail. Five minutes later, her father finds her car at the top of the mail, held near the mailbox. The motor's running, her purse is still in the car, and she's gone. It triggered one of the largest manhunts in the history of the state. Two weeks later, a nine-year-old girl, Deborah May Helmick, was snatched from in front of her own home not that far away. Now, in the meantime, the killer, unknown at this point, what we call the unsub or unknown subject, had been calling the Smith's house, describing having had her and what he, was, what he had done and what he was going to do, and teasing them with the idea that he was going to give himself up, that he was going to let Sherry go. And then he said, you'll get a letter from Sherry. Several days after she was abducted, they did get a letter. And the letter was entitled, handwritten. There's a, a photocopy of it in the book, mm -hmm. and it was entitled Last Will and Testament. And this was clearly from a, I don't know whether to call her a girl or a young woman. She was certainly a girl technically, but she was so mature beyond her years. When you see what she wrote, she said, I essentially, I know I'm going to die. I have faith that I'm going to heaven. Don't let this ruin your lives. All of this. It was just heartbreaking and staggering indicator of faith, grace, courage, anything you could think of, the exact polar opposite of the man who abducted her. Now, I don't know how much we want to fast forward, since I do want people to want to know what <laughs> happens next. But this case became about a really perfect example of really good detective work on mm -hmm. the sheriff's department's part of excellent profiling and behavioral analysis 
on the part of the FBI and John Douglas and forensic science on the part of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, all of which came together in a very interesting way to identify the killer. Then the next chapter of the story has to do with, could somebody who did the horrible things he did, is he sane or is he so mentally ill that he couldn't be responsible for it? And that's the next chapter. And that's what we had to prove. What is this guy really and what should happen to him? And there's a subtext that's probably there in all of our books, which is how much of what makes these people, makes them what they are, is nature and how much is nurture. It's probably a combination of both. And this is something Kristen should be interested in because John has always said, when John is asked, can you tell when these people are younger, when they're in school or teenagers, you tell who might end up going really bad. And he said, yes, but so can any good teacher. I'm not yeah. going to put your <laughs> potential predators in your class right now, but this actually, we're joking about it, but it does come into play when we're trying to evaluate who might be a threat, especially a school threat. We do. We did see recently with that Michigan school shooter, yeah. his teachers knew something was wrong. They could tell. Mm-hmm. And they were the first people to sound the alarm bell as they should have been. Yeah, I think John is right. Most good teachers... Observant teachers will be able to tell you at least. Yeah, and and even going back however many years it was now, I guess it was probably 2008, the Virginia Tech shooter. Yes. There were all kinds of red flags there. In fact, his English teacher, the distinguished African-American poet, Nikki Giovanni, had him in class and she went to her, she went to her department head and said, this guy, there's something really wrong with this guy. Get him mm-hmm. out of my class or I'm leaving. This guy's dangerous. I don't know what they actually did, but obviously it wasn't enough. I don't want to get off the subject, but one of the things we say is when you see these kind of symptoms, this is very much like with a doctor. If you have a chest pain, you very well may not have a heart attack. You may It may be muscular, it may be something else, but it certainly behooves you to check it out with mm-hmm. an expert and find out. And the same thing with these, these indicators of possible violence or aggression or social animosity. These things need to be checked out. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Mark, when you're writing a story like Sherry Smith's, what case materials do you have available to you? I know John Douglas is obviously an eminent member of the FBI family. Are files available to you? How does one go back and review what happened in a particular case like this? In a case like this, we do have a lot of files available to us. Also, since the case was adjudicated, there's a lot in the public domain. Once a case is put before the court, all the court materials become public. One of the most important things that were used in the profile were the recordings of these horrible phone calls. And a lot of information was obtained from that. And of course, we had transcripts of that. We had all of John's memories. And then what we do on a day-to-day basis, a case like this was publicized so heavily covered that I have probably three really full loose leaf notebooks full of copies of newspaper articles that were mm-hmm. literally day by day, and sometimes more than that, showing what happened. And that's really important, not only to get the insight on what was being thought of at the time, but with somebody like John, who has handled probably 5,000 cases in his career, he doesn't remember on a day by day basis exactly what happened. So When we have the newspaper coverage, along with copies of telegrams and various other communications, that really helps us say what happened in what order and knowing who knew what, when, because that's really important. Whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, you're still writing a mystery. So mystery has to be revealed in the order in which things happened. So having that newspaper file to look against really helped me come up with a timeline of what I think happened when. And then I go over it with John and I say, does this sound right? And he'll say, yeah. Or I said, you went down before the trial and talked to the prosecutor before the trial to talk about pretrial strategy. And he said, I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, I've got it right here that you did. He said, well, I guess I did then. Okay. And then you have to recreate that. 
the big responsibility is to recreate the scene in a way that it really rings true and that you don't make things either different or more glamorous than they were. From all the uh, true crime television series, you know, whoever is telling the story becomes the central person in the story. But uh, yes. we try very, while John is the central person in our story, we really try to hard to show who was doing what, when, and how he interacted with all. And of course, in this case, I have to say that the real hero or heroine of this story was Sherry Smith's sister, Dawn who was three years older than her, shared all of the same interests uh, in professional singing. She was just as religious and and observant. And she looked very much like Sherry. Mm -hmm. John ended up at great emotional cost to all of them, to the family, certainly, and to Dawn. He ended up using Dawn as bait to lure the killer out because he clearly was so obsessed with Dawn. This was a very risky move, although they had her heavily guarded. You can't do everything. So this was another aspect of the case. And Dawn was very generous in giving us her time and cooperating with us Mm -hmm. and reminiscing, if you will, about the case and also giving us family photographs so that we could include them. This has got to be such a gut-wrenching process, both for John having to relive it, for you having to experience it the first time, and then having to deal with all of the emotional aftermath. Like, How do you get away from all of that emotional gut-punching that you have to go through when you're writing? That must be terribly difficult. It is in a way, although fortunately, neither one of us has been through what Bill's been. I consider myself fortunate in that regard and that everything has been one step removed. I think what we've done though, what this has done, my association with John and my association with all of the victim families that we've dealt with over the years is we've become very close with a lot of what we call homicide survivors. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, but Billy, it's not. We really try to humanize them to show their heroism, their grace under pressure, the quest for justice. There's certain words we never use that we consider curse words, like closure, for instance. We know there's no closure. But, Thank you very but, much. Uh, we know things change, but they never close. That's a hole that, that stays there whenever you lose somebody like this. That part doesn't change. But Sherry was such a, I don't even, a gift of God, if you will. I don't know what else to call her, that she could see her whole life ahead of her. And then within minutes, her whole life was changed and she wouldn't have any of that. And yet deal with that with faith, with grace, with a nod toward trying to give her parents and her sister and brother something to hold on to. And then I contrast this with the man who abducted her and was going to kill her. I think of her sitting there lying there, chained to a bed with this man there, knowing he was going to kill her. And he was just giving her the opportunity to write out her last thoughts and prayers. And you'll see in the book, we came to the distinct conclusion that though this man certainly had some mental illness, certainly was not normal, certainly was evil, if you can use that word, Mm -hmm. I use advisedly, but this man knew what he was doing. He was able to control himself. He was able to plan. He was a sadistic jerk who really wanted to manipulate and control people and be the center of attention in a way he never could have through any legitimate means. I hope to the extent possible justice was done in this case. I like the fact that you did have to differentiate between, are you mentally ill, but does that also mean that you have known what you were doing? This is a question which comes up constantly in in criminal justice. And People say, to do what this person did, he must be insane. And first thing I say is, insane is not a scientific or a psychiatric term. It's a legal term. I will grant you that anyone who gets any kind of pleasure or satisfaction out of killing another person, doing anything to an innocent person in cold blood like that, is certainly mentally ill. I will give you that. No normal person, again, normal is a word we use advisedly because what's normal, but Mm -hmm. no ordinary person is going to be able to do what this person did. The question becomes, is he insane? The concept of insanity really goes back to English law when a man named Daniel McNaught, sometimes said, sometimes spelled McNaughton, 
tried to kill the British Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel. He ended up not killing him, but killing his private secretary. Then he was put on trial. And the question, was he acting in his right mind or was he so out of his mind that he wasn't responsible? Now, in this case, they said that he wasn't responsible, that he was that far out of his mind. But the tests that they use are basically still the same tests we use today, which is, did he know the difference between right and wrong? And was he able to conform his behavior to the dictates of society? Now, you notice I use his because it's almost always a him, times a woman, but not enough for us to make that distinction. The person really didn't know the difference between right and wrong and could not conform his behavior to the dictates of society. He probably is insane by a legal definition and therefore not responsible. He couldn't form what lawyers call in Latin the mens rea, the intent to do the act. But we also have another test, which is generally called the policeman at the elbow test, which is if this person would have committed the crime with a uniformed police officer standing right there, there's a good chance that person was insane. But if he would have controlled himself and not done the crime, seeing a uniformed police officer in view, then he probably had enough ability to conform his behavior to the dictates of society that he was not legally insane. So that's what we go on. And we made the case that all of the elements of this crime the planning, the execution of the crime, the ability to be organized and to avoid detection for so long, even using a voice modulator when he called the Smith Mm -hmm. fam so that he wouldn't be identified, knowing how long a police telephone trap and trace would take so he wouldn't Mm -hmm. stay on the phone any longer than that. He would make the phone calls from pay phones in the general area. Remember, this was era before cell phones. So this is somebody who just had a bad character, character defect. He was certainly sadistic. He certainly was a malignant narcissist. But we don't really worry about terms like that because they're psychiatric terms and they don't help us much in detection. John really came up with terms like organized, disorganized, (laughs) sadistic, or why you do the kind of things you do. This man did the kind of things he did to these women and young girls, and we think he probably killed two others that we were never able to prove because he wanted to, because this gave him more satisfaction than anything else in his sorry little life. One of the things that you all know from reading our previous books is for these kind of serial predators, violent predators, this is what's most important in their life. They may have jobs, they may have wives, they may have children, they may even be president of their church, like Dennis Rader, the Mm -hmm. BTK strangler. But this predation is the most important thing in their lives. They think about it all the time. They're on the hunt all the time. And when they're not on the hunt, they're thinking about it. Mark, you've no doubt received an education in profiling by working so closely with John Douglas. End up taking any formal classes in psychology or criminal profile? That's interesting. I guess I come by it semi-legitimately in that my (laughs) late father was a psychiatrist. And for a while, he worked at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which was the hospital for not only mentally ill, but the criminally insane in Washington, D.C. area. And I have taken classes at the FBI Academy with some of the real giants in the field, like Roy Hazelwood, who was in John's era. I was fortunate enough to be able to take some of the same classes that new agents take. So I do get it that way. And then hanging around John for the last (laughs) two decades or more, I've probably gotten pretty good tutorial in, in profiling. I think I've learned quite a bit. I think the difference between somebody like John and somebody like me is I can probably profile a case pretty well, but it takes a John Douglas to have the guts and the confidence to stand up before any kind of police group and say, here's what I think you ought to do, and here's what I think you shouldn't do. I wouldn't have the courage to stand up before a police task force and say, okay, here's what I think, and here's what you ought to do. I've actually successfully profiled a number of cases that way, but uh, informally, I wouldn't claim to be a professional at that. And you don't have thousands of cases and case consultations under your your partner does. That's true. I've studied them all, but I haven't actually, I haven't been actually out in the field doing them. 
So out of all of the cases that you guys have covered, and it's been a fair few at this point, is there one in particular that it just stays with you? I know Suzanne Collins was a very... That one certainly stays with us, which we talked about in Journey into Darkness. That one, this one, the Sherry Smith case definitely stays with us. There are a number of them. I think probably the Atlanta child murders in 1980 and 1981 was very important because it really helped establish FBI's behavioral science profiling division as a successful unit. It was a really a proof of concept. There have been a bunch of them. And I think the interesting thing to answer your question in another way is each case shows us something different mm-hmm. about a person. With the Joseph Paul Franklin case that we wrote about last time, one of the big issues was where would he go? How would he be found? He was on the run. And how do you know where to look for him? By the same token, when we wrote the cases that haunt us, where we really went back and looked at a number of cases that John had not been involved in because they happened in many instances before both of us were born, but murder cases that we thought really hadn't been resolved in a way that the public was satisfied with. I think the Jack the Ripper case, 1888, Mm -hmm. often thought of as the first publicly defined serial killer case, although it probably wasn't. The Lizzie Borden case we talked about Certainly, the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's son in 1932 was an absolutely fascinating case that, even though we think we, we know what happened, has a lot of loose ends. Join us again next time as we continue our conversation with Mark Olshaker regarding the new book he's written with FBI profiler John Douglas, When a Killer Calls, a haunting story of murder, crime profiling, and justice in a small town. Thanks for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>